to imagine what it would have been like on the 14th of April 2010 when the volcano Eyjafjallajökull erupted into a clear blue sky, quite different to what it's like today. And Eyjafjallajökull is behind me, high up there in the mountains. And I want to find out more about the effects of that eruption on the people of Iceland. And I want to look forward and think about the effects of future eruptions here in Iceland. In March 2010, magma broke through the crust beneath the Eyjafjallajökull glacier in a series of fiery eruptions. On the 14th of April 2010, the second eruptive phase began. A series of explosive eruptions sent huge quantities of ash into the atmosphere, turning day into night. Meanwhile, high-level winds carried the finer ash particles east and south to affect European airspace. Hundreds of flights were cancelled, disrupting passengers and freight transport across the world. Whilst in England, we were concerned about the ash cloud, here in Iceland, people were much more concerned about the prospects of flooding. You see, when the volcano erupted underneath the ice cap, it melted a huge amount of water, and that water had to escape and it had to go somewhere. And nobody really knew exactly where it was going to go. And had it come down the valley behind me, then it would have swept away all these farm buildings. Oh, now, this is interesting. You see the length of the grass here, it's quite long, and it was like this in April 2010. And that was very important because it held the ash close to the ground surface. They had about five centimetres of ash here, and had the grass not been growing so long, that ash would have been swept and blown around the area. It would have caused a lot of disruption. Now, the farmers were told not to expect a very good crop that year because the ash was covering most of the grass. But in actual fact, the warmth of the ash and then subsequently the nutrition from the ash enabled the grass to grow very well. And the farmers actually had a pretty good harvest that year. To find out more about the effects of the eruption on the family living here on the farm, I visited the Eyjafjallajökull Visitor Centre just across the road from the farm. There have been earthquakes since the 1990s and it took a while for the eruption to happen. Then in 2010, in March, there was an eruption in Fimmerdehals. We didn't expect it to happen, but we knew there were many earthquakes, but they were so small that it didn't really, it didn't really look like it would happen. But then there was a farmer who saw a red flame in the mountain and they figured out there was eruption. Can you tell me what the effects of the eruption were on you and your family? It was uh, quite of a shock for us, of course, and we have not experienced a, an eruption here in this area. So we were warned about flooding and ash that would come over the farm. Of course, we had to think about our am animals. We had to uh, feed them uh, for a few days in advance because we didn't know how long there would be until we could visit the farm again. Inga, we're surrounded here by really interesting displays. Can you tell me a bit more about the centre? This centre was opened uh, only one year after the erup eruption. And we are showing here a film about my family on the farm and how, how we dealt with the eruption. We have had over 300,000 visitors uh, since then. The volcano Eyjafjallajökull is not due to erupt again any time soon, but I gather that the real concern of people here is about the volcano Katla. Can you tell me a little bit about that? We are not so worried about Katla, uh, not exactly in this area, uh, because there is no danger of flooding here from that glacier, because it's further away. But however, we are of course also thinking about what kind of uh, or how much ash would come from Katla. It could go anywhere, depending on the wind, and uh, if it would come over here, uh, which is quite likely, uh, then we need to be prepared for that as well. Finally, Inga, can you tell me how you and your family and the people of Iceland prepare yourselves for future eruptions? We are uh, always thinking about the possibility of eruption, and when we are building houses, or uh, th then we try to make them as solid as possible and we try to repair old buildings as well so that they are ready uh, to take some ash. And uh, after that is done, then the, the civil protection, they will, they will check if everybody have left. So that's quite safe to, to be here in the area.
It was really interesting to speak to Inga and find out more about her perceptions of the volcanic hazard here in Iceland. I'm off now to see the area affected by the floodwaters. When the water came out from underneath the ice cap, it entered this river. This is the Markfjot River. This is where the glacial waters came after the eruption. It's quite dramatic here today, but it must have been amazing when the floodwaters poured down here. And that water was quite warm, about 17 degrees Celsius, and it would have contained also icebergs. And that water rushed down here at a tremendous rate of knots towards the sea. And if you look behind me, you can see the embankments that have recently been reinforced. And those embankments held the water within the contains of the river very effectively. And they stopped what would have been very widespread flooding over the whole of the area here. And it's that flooding that the farm that we saw earlier was particularly concerned with. I'm further downstream now at the place where the main road, the N1, crosses the river. And this metal bridge beside me was largely unaffected by the floods, amazingly. And the reason for that is because either side the road goes on an embankment and the embankments were broken through deliberately by workmen in the area using bulldozers. And that allowed the waters, the flood waters, to rush past and effectively retain this bridge. This bridge was left unaffected pretty much by those floods. Ari Trusti is a well-known geologist here in Iceland and I want to ask him some questions about volcanic activity and in particular about the threat posed by Katla. Ari, can you tell me how big was the eruption of Eyjafjallajökull in comparison to the other eruptions in Iceland? Well, I would say sort of medium-sized because we, we have this what we call a, a, a way index, V-E-I, and uh, it goes up to eight and the Eyjafjallajökull was about three to four on that index, so it was medium-sized. The, the eruption of Eyjafjallajökull produced a huge amount of ash and not a lot of lava. Can you tell me why? First of all, the ash wasn't that much uh, in volume. It was about, there were about 230 million cubic meters. If you compact it to solid rocks, it's about 170 cubic million cubic meters of, of, of magma. And that's not really much, but the reason for uh, <clears throat> the eruption producing uh, a lot of uh, flying material, te we call it tephra, uh, is that uh, during the, the first phase of the summit uh, eruption, uh, there was a lot of water entering the vent. And when magma and water meet, it's explosive, producing the pyroclastics. Then later on, when water didn't enter the vent, uh, the composition of the magma, uh, the content of the uh, gases, high pressure, uh, was of that size or scale that the uh, eruption remained more or less uh, explosive, ash producing. There was some lava flowing, a minor amount, uh, eating its way through the ice, but it was mainly because of these two different uh, uh, reasons, water, and then the chemical composition. The eruption caused a lot of disruption both in Iceland and abroad. Tell me how volcanoes are monitored. Basically there is a very large net of uh, measurement devices. Uh, the main uh, parts are two things, uh, seismometers measuring all the, the, the trembling of the earth and then uh, GPS antennas with constant reading, so they, they tell us if the Earth is moving up or down or sideways. And by combining this and also scientific knowledge, um, uh, the volcanoes are monitors. There are about 120 of these GPS stations. There are more than 80 seismic stations, and they line the, the active volcanic uh, zone of Iceland. So uh, this is all being uh, fed to our central station with the Met Office in Iceland. It's a pretty elaborate uh, system and by that people are trying to forecast eruptions of the earthquakes as well as monitoring if everything happens. This is very important uh, in the beginning of an eruption because if it's big or if it's badly placed uh, we need some uh, measures 
to be taken to prevent uh, damage or even even more serious things. I'm told that the volcano Katla is overdue to erupt. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, there are signs of that. Uh, she, she is a lady, she is preparing uh, uh, to erupt. But as with, for example, uh, AF at Leogul, that took 16 years, we don't know how the prelude is, how, how long it, the prelude is really. So uh, the only thing we can say is that uh, the process is still ongoing, uh, will end probably with an eruption, but when and how big this eruption is going to be, it's uh, impossible to say. But of course, the longer the, uh, the, the, the repose is, the, the bigger and more violent the uh, eruption could be, but that's not even a rule. So would there be any warning signs, you know, in the, in the, in the hours and the days beforehand? Uh, we know that from, from accounts, from old accounts, that there are uh, uh, earthquakes, uh, even, even uh, uh, more than 24 hours prior to the eruption. Uh, we know that the big ones, four, five in size, they would be uh, the first real signs of something would be happening. Uh, then, of course, the uh, eruption has to melt its way through the ice. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the big flood usually happens two, three, four hours after the first sign of, uh, of the eruption above the, above the uh, ice cap. So we know, we know this from, from prior uh, eruptions, and I'm, I'm certain that uh, this would not come as a surprise to us. So we will have uh, hours, even days, to prepare. It's a relief to know that volcanoes in Iceland are being very comprehensively monitored, and Ari seems certain that there will be some warning signs before Katla next erupts. I'm interested to find out how Iceland's volcanic legacy is affecting tourism. Can you tell me about the impacts of the eruption on tourism in Iceland? Well, I think uh, when the eruption started, it got us quite worried uh, that things would really go badly for Iceland. But uh, it's shown that to be quite the opposite. I mean, the, the Google search went sky high and Iceland was certainly on the map for most of the world, even though the reactions of the airlines may have been a little bit overreact. Uh, it has helped us in so many ways and tourism, which was quite important at that time, is now by far the biggest industry in Iceland and uh, it's estimated to be about 1.7 million tourists coming into Iceland this year, which is about five times the number of people that live here. Uh, so it has had a very positive effect on tourism in Iceland to have that eruption happening and we are waiting for the next one. <laughs> and I understand that you're developing a brand new project in Iceland. Yeah, lava is Iceland's first uh, and only volcanic and, uh, and uh, earthquake centre to be established in Iceland, focusing on the geology of Iceland, uh, our natural forces, which are all coming from the mantle plume that is we are now sitting on top of. And this is a, a brand new thing, uh, which is going to be an interactive educational experience. We'll be focusing on all the elements of nature, meaning you will feel the heat, you will feel the tremble of the earth, and we are planning to open in May 2017. The work is already on its way, and uh, it's going to be a, a huge uh, addition to the experience of people coming into Iceland to learn more about geology and the nature that we actually live in. And this is something we want to explain to people, how we can cope with those natural forces without being worried that it's going to harm us in any way. It's been fascinating to visit the locations affected by the eruption of Eyjafjallajökull back in 2010 and to consider what may happen when Katla erupts sometime in the future. It's clear that the people in Iceland have learned not just to live with the threat of impending eruptions, but to grasp the opportunities offered by Iceland's rich volcanic heritage.